Hi, I'm Jesse Krems, and today we'll be taking a look inside security at the New York Times. This talk is also unofficially titled A Media Security Primer for Hackers, but it's really for both journalists and hackers. Most talks start off or end with a thank you at the end. Everybody rushes off stage thanking all their friends. But really, I'd like to start this talk off by saying thank you to a bunch of people. First of all, my girlfriend for all her love and support and for, um, you know, putting up with all my craziness when I'm like, hey, honey, I need you to get out of the apartment while I record my talk because I don't want anyone to see me doing it because that would be weird. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone at the New York Times who's uh, reviewed this talk with me and helped me make improvements and helped me dot all the I's and cross all the T's and make sure everything looks really nice and sharp. We really do try to get this story right every time. Um, it's been a crazy couple of years, uh, and in that time, we've all gotten to watch a lot of movies and get to watch the Fred Rogers movie. It was really great. And there's a scene in that movie where they take a couple of moments just to think about all the people in their lives who have helped them get to the stage in life where they are right now. And we don't do that enough. So let's just take a few moments right now to just sit quietly and think about all the people that have helped us get to where we are in our lives. Day. All right, all right, all right. Let's get this show on the road. So I'm really going to quickly start off with my journey. I think this will help uh, reveal some of my biases and some of the stuff in my life that kind of formed how I got here and why I think th certain things are neat and some aren't. Um, I've been a long time DEF CON goon. My first DEF CON was DEF CON 6. Uh, and that was a really uh, pivotal moment in my life. Um, working at DEF CON really has given me a lot of confidence, but it's also given me uh, a lot of life lessons in A, working with uh, really tight timelines, really chaotic environments, really challenging people, um, and really learning about how to deal with just uh, time-based pressures in a technical and logistical way. Um, from my experience at DEF CON, I ended up starting a nonprofit called the Hacker Foundation, where I had my first interactions with the media as a subject, um, but also doing a little media support, which was also very interesting. Um, and that was great. And then, you know, for years I had I had regular jobs. I was a bike messenger, um, I was a caterer, I did, you know, stuff. I, I, uh, I was a webmaster for a brewery, and then, um, and I was a wireless engineer, and then I was doing offensive security for the phone company. Those were all great jobs. Uh, people I worked with were wonderful, but I really um, felt like I needed to just, you know, look a little bit more at stuff. And uh, I heard about this thing called the Internet Freedom Festival in Valencia, Spain, and I decided I'd go go to it and see what it was like. It was a really different conference from uh, DEF CON in a lot of ways, A lot of, very different from a lot of hacker cons. Um, but similar, you know, in, in the way that all festivals are. And uh, I got to meet a bunch of journalists from around the world there. And I was talking to, they had these, okay, so they had these little tiny beers called Caña in uh, in Spain. Uh, they're one euro. It's really great. It's a little, little small beer. It's about just as much beer as you want. So I'm having a beer with this journalist and we're talking about stuff. And he's like, oh, I have this source I want to talk to. And I want to talk to him, you know, kind of, I don't want to, be, you know, overwatched by the government. And so I'm like, oh, okay, well, you should call him on signal. That's that's a really good method. And he uh, he says, oh, no, no, he doesn't have a he doesn't have a cell phone. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, you have to call him on a landline. Here's some stuff you can do to minimize the risk. You can't negate it, but you can minimize it. And um, uh, he goes, oh, no, no, he doesn't have that type of phone. He has this type of phone. And I'm like, oh, interesting. So, you know, this is the importance of getting more details. So basically, the source that he was trying to talk to was a villager uh, who had a party line. So if you called that number, you called everyone in the village. Uh, and he, so, and I was like, this is a really hard problem. I don't have a solution for you now. And I still actually don't have a solution for this problem. But it stuck with me. It sticks with me today. I think about this problem. I think it's a really good um, and interesting problem. And these are some of the technical security challenges that journalists are dealing with. Uh, and so I left Valencia, Spain, went back to my regular life, as it were. But I kept thinking about um, uh, 
what was this, this stuff. And I started spending more time in New York City and there's sort of something very special there. And then I, um, I uh, saw a job opening at the New York Times. I said, you know what? You, 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 won't, you won't get the chance to do this again. You should apply. So I applied. Um, I contacted someone I knew at the New York Times and said, hey, can you reach into the pile and pull mine out because I have a non-traditional background. My resume not even gets seen by anyone. So my resume got passed around to some folks. They looked at it. I did a phone screen. I did an interview. I did another interview. I did a day's worth of in-person team interviews, um, and they liked me. They really liked me, so I uh, I got a job offer and I took it, and that's how I ended up at the New York Times. You know, apply for the job, get the job. Not that complicated, right? Um, and since day one, it's been a very exciting, fulfilling, and rewarding job. And that's 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 the quick that's the quick version of how I ended up at the New York Times, working full-time in media journalism. Uh, I think it's important, though, to think about what gets you up every day. Um, the getting the job is not the end of the journey, it's the beginning of the journey, or it's the beginning of another phase of the journey. So uh, one of the things I really like about my job is that I think it's a civic good. I think newsmaking organizations, the fourth estate, is a key part of a country, and is and it's really important to put, uh, to be an engaged citizen in that country. So I basically do that all the time now, which is really nice. Um, the job isn't just about protecting shareholder value. We are a publicly traded company, um, but it's not just about making money. It really is a very mission-oriented uh, job and company, which is great. I really enjoy that. Um, the problems are hard. They're hard in both technical ways, but also in logistical and very human ways. The um, you know, if you have a really whiz-bang, super awesome technical solution, which can't explain it to somebody over the phone, or they don't have the equipment, or they don't even know how to use the uh, technology, it doesn't matter, right? It won't solve the problem. So uh, coming up with solutions that are really, um, uh, you know, uh, work in a variety of environments under a variety of stressors is really, really a delight. So that's great. Um, the people at the New York Times are characters. There's tons of great characters. They make movies about these people, but then you end up meeting them in the hall and having coffee with them and being like, huh, interesting. Uh, they're, they're, fun, they're a fun bunch. Um, and they're driven and they're passionate and they're persistent, which is, you know, I think a lot of qualities that hackers enjoy. Um, and the work is evergreen, right? The work we do is, uh, I always feel like every day I go in, we're always getting new challenges and new new things are always popping up. The news happens all the time. I also think that there's a kind of cousin relationship between journalists and hackers. Uh, we're both very interested in having information free to the public so that the public can make uh, well-informed decisions. Um, hackers really tend to be very interested in acquiring info and showing it off to their friends because look what I can get. Um, journalists tend to be a little bit more downstream. They tend to be more like, look at this information I got from some hacker. This is great. Let me show it off to the world. Uh, they also um, tend to be very rigorous in their analysis of that information, which I think is you know, much needed. So let's just really quickly talk about New York Times by the numbers. Um, there are no typical news organizations. The, the New York Times isn't a typical news organization um, in many ways. It's 169 years old. It's going to be 170. It's a birthday next year. Yay. Um, as you can imagine, a company that old has a lot of technical debt, but it also has a lot of history. And um, that history is, 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 is good. Um, uh, one of the great things about working at the Times in the before times was that we went in the office and many floors below the one that I work on is the archive. So went down to the archive and uh, got to paw through the paper card catalog index for uh, Felix Krems, who is, uh, a, I believe, a great, great cousin of mine or an uncle maybe. Um, anyway, he was a big time Broadway actor at one point. And so got to find his name in the card catalog, then go into the actual like archive stacks 
and pull out vintage photos of him that were provided by his agent to the Times, which was, and hold them and show them off to my family, which was great. Um, really a wonderful experience. We have a lot of great people who work at the Times. We have 4,500 employees. This includes reporters. This includes people that print the paper. This includes admins and tech staff. This includes developers. We have 1,700 reporters worldwide, which is a huge amount of people to help. Um, 200 of them are overseas. Those 200 are really uh, some of the best reporters we have because they're the only person you can sometimes send to a place because they're the only person logistically available to do the work. So they have to be well prepared and on top of the situation and really understand what's going on there. They're really the tip of the pen. It's very exciting to work with our foreign journalists or our overseas journalists. Um, we have 500 developers. No other company makes the New York Times app and website like the New York Times. Um, we that it's it's new territory for every everybody all the time. So we're constantly learning and being challenged um, and developing new things with our developers. Uh, we have 31 foreign bureaus and 16 national bureaus. So we have offices globally and nationally and a variety of other facilities. We have a factory that prints newspapers, which is pretty cool. Um, and then now we also have a very uh, diversified workforce uh, who lives and works all over the, uh, the, the world and the country. So that's that's a whole new challenge is just that geographical spread, right? We don't just have to keep everybody safe in HQ, as it were. Um, we have 7.8 million subscribers. That's a lot of subscriber data. That's uh, That includes, you know, all kinds of uh, PII. Um, we have 100, uh, 100 million plus registered users, uh, which represents a huge amount of data, uh, which we also have to keep safe, of course. And then if you actually think about that, you know, classic uh, InfoSec training, CIA training, uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, not the other CIA. Um, so, you know, we have we have to get the paper out all the time. We have to get the news out on the newspaper and on the print and on the website. So, you know, and that's that's average weekly audience of seven seven point six million people. That's a lot of people to to, to reach. Um, we move a lot of data just in general, right? We print. We produce 150 plus pieces of journalism every day. And it's not just print, it's not just photos, it's podcasts and TV shows and, and, and live streams of events and stuff like that. And finally, there's a plus sign after all the stuff on this slide, right? That's because we're growing and growth brings its own challenges. I used to work for in a dying industry and that has its own challenges too. But growth has a lot of challenges that it feels fun but it's also very scary. And so I think uh, that's a whole other uh, interesting kind of it's a pseudo number. So that's the New York Times by the numbers in a nutshell. This isn't just me. I'm not the only person at the, at the work in InfoSec at the Times or even work in security. The InfoSec team at the New York Times is composed of the security operations team. I work on that team. We uh, are the front lines we answer and advise on all kinds of questions and issues every day, every hour. Um, I'm on call at this very instant recording this talk. We have an intelligence team uh, who does both forward and backward looking intelligence gathering to help us figure out what threats we need to align to and where to best use our resources. We have an education team. Education is a huge part of what we do because the, of the independence of so much of our staff. Um, Having well-educated, well-prepared staff is really very, very key. Like I said, we have our own apps. We have our own apps. So then we have our own AppSec team, uh, which is really another key key thing. Uh, we have a secure architecture team because we have imagine this a gi giant technical, uh, a giant uh, cloud presence. So of course we have a secure architecture team. Uh, incidents happen. If they didn't happen, none of us would have jobs. So having an incident response team who can guide both, uh, who can help uh, the InfoSec team do their job better when we're responding to incidents, but also guide the other people involved in that incident through the process. It's wonderful. I live in New York City. New York City has been hit with all kinds of uh, business continuity events within my lifetime, uh, and not just like in the last 20 years. So. 
that's a so we have a so that's another thing that we, we is also within the infosec sphere. And then finally, of course, we're a business, so we have to manage our risk and our compliance needs, just like every other business out there. We're not the only security operation at the Times. We also have a physical security team, um, nationally, and internationally, uh, and both of and all three of these teams, infosec, national, and international, all meet together on the threat response team, where we uh, we. We trade intelligence and we, we work on ways that we overlap because increasingly there is a great deal of overlap in what all, all we all do together. Um, and when, you know, that's just the security apparatus, right? That's the people who have security somewhere in their title. But we also have really wonderful sysadmins out there who really um, you know, hold the standard and do a really, really good job of making sure that our systems are secure so we don't have to bug them. That's so nice when you have really top motivated sysadmins uh, making it happen. So we don't have to be like, hey, it's Patch Tuesday, you gotta patch that. They're already like, we patch that. I'm like, even better. Um, we have a great end user support team out there who just listens to our users. So when the user says this thing, <laughs> and they're like, oh, that's a security event. You need to talk to these people right now. Um, and then we have folks in the newsroom, editors, support staff, and journalists who help us coordinate um, inform us of events, inform us of threats that they've they've gotten both in the physical but also in the uh, technological sphere. Tell us about all kinds of you know stuff they're hearing on the street, which is also really wonderful. And then also, the past has helped us. We we've learned a lot from the past and from the people who have been at the times before us who have helped build the organization and the and the team. So. You know, you can't, it's not just, it's just not, not just now that got us to where we are. The, the present is made by the past and the past has contributed mightily. So here's a quick guide for journalist security for hackers. Um, but also conversely, if you're a journalist, this is also for you. Um, this is a really great um, uh, graph that kind of shows the threat continuum for journalists out there. And, um, you know, on one side we have murder and on one side we have litigation. Uh, death, uh, death is a very real concern for a lot of journalists. This is a very high risk job in a lot of ways. It shouldn't be, but it is. And it's not typically what one would consider a high risk job. But in 2020, 66 journalists lost their lives in the course of reporting. Just today, I was reading in the paper about a reporter who lost their job in a conflict area, or lost their life in a conflict area. Um, and the week before, a journalist also lost their life covering a, covering a parade. Um, and targeted killings by repressive governments that are too often willing to kill journalists, to keep citizens in the dark about their actions, does happen. So we always have to factor that in when we're thinking about the physical security um, aspects of journalism. This also kind of plays into the infosec, which is not traditionally something we would do, but um, increasingly uh, uh, repressive governments and non-state actors use technology to assist um, them in precursor activities to um, murder. So, uh, going down the matrix really quick, we have harassment. I have a slide for this. We'll talk about this in a bit. Um, we don't, so the security team at the New York Times doesn't protect journalism. We protect journalists. And journalist's job is to protect journalism. And that means, you know, producing high quality journalistic works and not self-censoring. It means that they should, our job is to keep them safe enough so that they don't feel that they can't cover a story because it's too hot, it's too sensitive. Um, and this, this ties in the next thing, right? If they think that, people are after them uh, from hacking, that's an issue. So we help protect against that as well. Political pressure, that's a that's basically way above my pay grade, but it's definitely something that does um, stop or does concern some journalists at some times. Denying access is another way that um, uh, journalists work is threatened, right? Uh, either in the withholding or manipulation of press credentials, um, or to deportation, you know, uh, PNG, persona non grata, someone out of a country so they can't come back is something that does happen and has happened 
uh, in the two years that I have worked at the New York Times. Um, two journalists. Add pressure as a factor. Um, uh, boycotting the New York Times or another or new, another news organization through ad through uh, people that would advertise with the, with the Times is definitely an influence that has affected um, organization media organizations uh, worldwide. Censorship. Right now, there's some government censoring the New York Times somewhere in the world, uh, either overtly or covertly. Um, we at the Times try to, to provide news to everyone as much as possible all the time. Uh, we, For example, I was talking with a colleague today about our, our onion, the New York Times' version of the Onion Service. We do have an Onion Service online, and that's specifically as part of our, our censorship busting operations. Um, uh, reputational attacks. There are attacks against the uh, practice of journalism, against the organization, and of course against the the reporter themselves trying to delegitimize them. And that's that's a more you know long term uh, kind of highbrow argument, but I think it's also a definite concern of journalists. And then finally, at the very end of the spectrum is litigation and lawfare where we like to think that very civil people use very civil words in a very civil environment um, to, uh, to try to win civil arguments. This doesn't always occur, but we like to think that that happens. So there are kind of three bins um, that, that are in here. And, and one of them, the last one, kind of doesn't fall in the matrix because it kind of pervades all of them, actually. Um, there's the physical security stuff, which is an increasing concern year after year. Um, in, in in journalism, increasingly year after year, is also the need for increased uh, information in cybersecurity, um, as as technology plays a bigger and bigger role in reporting, both and our lives, both as a day to day activity, but also in the nature of how reporting is done. Um, understanding how technology works, um, how big data manip big data can be um, uh, understood and analyzed is really key. Uh, finally, there's a psychosocial security concern here. Um, it's taken, I don't know how long has journalism existed for, right? For, for, for ages. It's taken a long time for people to realize that the day-to-day -day stresses of being a journalist takes a serious and possibly negative toll on the practitioners. Um, and so when we're working with journalists and we're talking about security practices, we're really trying to... Um, to train them for an ultra marathon, not a sprint. The best, most fun journalists to hang out with are uh, uh, the ones who've been around the block a lot. They have great stories, they're really well seasoned, and they have some really good security practices based on some hard won lessons. So any um, media information security organization would definitely take a look at all of these things um, that are highlighted here in bold as something that they would pay attention to on a regular basis. So I mentioned harassment at the beginning, I kind of glossed over it, but let's look at harassment. We're going to throw a bunch of numbers at you, but I think it's, I, I want to get this point through. Um, according to, so uh, Lucy at the CPJ helped put these numbers together for me because this is not something that I look at the numbers of every day. But in 2019, 90% um, of respondents uh, to one of their studies, two journalists, experienced safety issues or threats in the USA, which is we like to consider one of the more safe countries um, to, to be a journalist. Um, uh, and then, you know, large numbers of, of, of journalists have um, been harassed in various ways. 63% of all journalists have been harassed online. I think we in the InfoSec community are familiar with the fact that people get harassed online. Journalists get it all the time and they get it in very real ways. Um, Following up that number very shortly, very shortly behind it, 58% have been harassed in person. I have, you know, I've had my run-ins in life, but I haven't been systematically harassed in person, right? Um, I can think of one or two incidents, right? But um, in this case, you know, it happens to a lot of people who work in journalism. Finally, this bottom number, 26% have been physically attacked, right? So one in four, a little bit more than one in four, have been, you know, attacked in the course of doing their work. 
that's a that's a pretty big percentage for a job that isn't really about getting in you know physical altercations. They're not wrestlers here. Um, and and the other thing to think about is that this is there's some uh, disparity here, right? Uh, women get this way more than way worse than than men. Um, Two thirds of women respondents say that they've been threatened or harassed online at least once, according to the International Women's Media Foundation. And one in ten respond, one in ten of their people that they've surveyed has said that they've experienced a death threat in the last year. Not just harassment, but a straight up death threat. Um, and I and I see these threats, and they're real. They're 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 not people aren't joking. As I, you know. So harassment's a real issue, and it's something we deal with on a regular basis. Um, and it goes hand in hand with social media presence. Having a strong social media presence for a journalist is a huge, huge career asset. Um, if you look at big names at any media organization, they usually have big followings on social media, on Twitter or, or Instagram or whatnot. Um, it, some media organizations don't realize this, but curating and maintaining your presence on social media is work. So one of the reasons I don't do it is because I don't want to do the work. I don't want to have a big social media presence because I want to do other things. Um, and with that presence will come harassment. Most platforms are woefully unprepared to provide any real support regarding um, online harassment, uh, both to journalists and to just regular people. Uh, I think there's plenty of evidence of that um, if you look through the uh, mind sphere of the InfoSec community online. Um, so. One of the places that I always see a lot of people get um, kind of spur of the moment harassment is from hot takes or spur of the moment comments. So I always advise journalists to be thoughtful and consider about everything they post online um, and that they separate their personal and their private and their public persona um, so that they uh, so they get some separation because it's, it's, they deserve it, frankly. Um, but yeah, hot takes tend to tend to get people in some trouble. Um, but they should have the right to have hot takes. <laughs> people just need to start being nicer to each other. So uh, really quickly, uh, people often ask me, where do um, where does where does the responsibility for security of journalists lie? And it really lies with the journalists themselves. The buck stops with them because there's a ton of competing interests. And my interests are not necessarily uh, the same as a journalist, the same as an editor. The editor isn't the same as the journalist, and the journalist isn't the same as, you know, all those other things. It's, they, they, everybody has different needs and wants and desires here. Um, so finally, at the end of the day, it's really the journalist's decision. Um, and if they're going to cover a story and how they're going to cover that story. The job of the InfoSec team or any security team working with the media is to prepare them with the best tools and knowledge available um, and give them the freedom and respect to uh, take care of themselves and also do the best they can covering that story. That's it. But it's often the journalist's job to make sure it goes down correctly. So let's really tr quickly talk about training and advisement. That's something that we spend a lot of time doing at the a lot of time we do at the times. Um, training is, you know, uh, lessons, uh, uh, pre-prepared -pre lessons, um, where we really get people brought up to speed on proper techniques and tools. And advisement is when they, they come to us and say, hey, Jesse, I got this question. And we think about it, and we give them the best advice we can about what they can do. Um, this is often what will happen if you, as a security professional, end up working with any news organization or media person. They will ask for advice about something. Um, so make your advice actionable. Journalists have a lot of competing interests, and uh, their time is very valuable. And um, you know they, they basically have to deal, deal with a ton of stuff. So making practices that are doable and not theoretical is really the best thing I can su suggest. Um, but they are curious and persistent folks, so expect them to ask you challenging questions about the practice or advisement you give them.
right. So here are five basic practice practices for journalists. As a journalist, you should be doing these. As a information security professional and a hacker, and journalists are asking you for advice, this is the five pieces of advice. Maybe you should give them. It's a great starting point. Use strong, diverse passwords on all your accounts. Please, please, please. You're going to have a lot of accounts as a journalist. Um, and so you're going to need to use strong, diverse passwords. This will, have me this will of course, mean you need to use a password manager. Any, uh, any password manager out there is probably better than no password manager. Um, and a real online password manager that's backed up, that's securely operated and securely run is really the best solution. Um, notebooks, things you remember, iterations of things you remember are really, really not um, going to work. Use second factor authentication on everything you can, as much as you can. Skip over doing it with SMS, though. Use authenticator apps and use hardware tokens. Uh, use authenticator apps that back up to your password manager uh, the, the, so that if your phone is, is lost, stolen, or confiscated, you can, um, you can get back in the game real quick and you don't have to re-enroll everything. Use hardware tokens whenever possible. Um, uh, have two um, and have the codes, of course. The, uh, one of the key things to do is to take that second token and keep it in a safe place um, and not carry two with you at all times, just have the one on you at all times. Use a VPN, use it on every untrusted network that you run across, that you're operating your computer or phone on. Any untrusted network is not your home network and not your work network. So pretty much all the weird networks you jump on, all the press pool networks at the Olympics or at a convention or something, especially this convention. Um, companies should have a VPN for getting into its own assets. It, journalists should collect third-party VPNs um, as they see fit. Uh, there's a bunch of great ones out there. There's plenty of market research about which ones are the best. Just choose one that's a high quality, reputable VPN provider. Keep track of your assets, where you store your information. Divide your public and private assets. Your work computer shouldn't be your personal computer if at all possible. I know this sounds annoying, but it's a really uh, uh, good thing to do. Um, for a number of reasons. If you're a freelancer, I know this is really tricky, um, but uh, you know, definitely think about uh, keeping as much of your public and private life separate from a, from a data compartmentalization or information compartmentalization standpoint. Um, update early, update often. I don't know anyone who suffered greatly from updating to the latest version of some OS or patching their systems. I do know people who have suffered greatly from not doing that. Use secure messaging platforms. Use Signal for as much messaging as you can. You can even use it to securely store your notes. You can just message yourself notes, right? Uh, Signal is a great tool. We, we really like it. Um, the other secure messaging platforms out there have a lot of different interests that don't always seem to align with their user interests. The, um, uh, but you're going to have to go where the source is. So whenever possible, try to shift the signal. But if you have to use one of those other third-party um, messaging platforms, secure messaging platforms, uh, do find the online guides that are out there about running uh, those more securely um, so that you can minimize your attack surface and your exposure. So it's not just reporters who are part of the newsroom. There's also editors out there. So here's the five basic practices for editors. Um, you really need to communicate known security risks to your journalists. If you know it's a security risk, your journalist who has maybe been around for a long time or maybe hasn't, may not know them for whatever reasons. Let them know. Tell them, you know, these are the things that I am concerned about um, for your safety or your information security safety regarding this story. When a journalist comes to you with security concerns, you need to listen to them and factor them into the reporting. You also need to connect that reporter with support systems, be them in-house or external, to help them stay safe. Uh, it's really very, very, very useful 
when an editor says, hey, I've got a team, they're going to cover the story, can you talk to them? Have a regular and clear cadence of communication with your reporters when they're in the field. This is really key. Always start off the conversation with the same basic question set, PSI. What's their position? Right? Where are they in the story, physically in the world, and where are they in the story? What's their situation? What's the environment around them looking like? What's the situation looking like? And what are they planning to do next? If we can get those, if you can have those three uh, pieces of information handy when something goes wrong, or you think something might be going wrong, then your security team will be able to provide even better support. And finally, you have to do all the things in the previous slide. You need to be the example of how to do um, secure journalism securely. So the fun never ends. It never gets easier as you move up the old hierarchy in the newsroom tree. So that's the basics for journalists and editors in the newsroom. Let's talk a little bit about some of the stuff that we in the InfoSec team deal with on a regular basis and it's more of what we do. So here's the more of what we do. You know, we help uh, journalists and editors gather and secure source material all the time. Uh, we uh, make sure that we don't cross any legal red lines. We never instruct sources on how to, um, how to get information. We, uh, that's not our job, we're not doing that. We're look, really looking for sources to, they have something they wanna give us, they collect it and they deliver it to us. We operate a tips line uh, and we operate our own secure drop servers from the Freedom of the Press, Press Foundation so people can get us that, um, that information. Also, uh, we will develop um, solutions if, if needed. Um, we are always concerned about the uh, intent and operation of nation state actors, um, both on how they are interacting with our journalists and what capabilities they have, and whether or not they've exercised those capabilities against us or other news organizations. As, as a telecommunications guy, I'm super into you know telecommunications security, so all the types of uh, communications both in how it can be used for surveillance, how it can be used for uh, uh, interception. So we stay on, we, we're, we're constantly looking at that um, and trying to improve our own telecommunications security as best we can within the operating environment we're in. Uh, we operate a factory that makes newspapers. So we have all the industrial control systems you might imagine that exist in any factory out there, which is really great. Um, it's also really challenging because it's a lot, it's very different from a lot of the other stuff we've talked about today. Um, I said it before, I'll say it again. You know, we, we have our own um, uh, apps that we, we build. So having secure applications that are both externally facing, like the one on your phone, from the New York Times is a crossword, but also internal apps that we use to build, run, and operate the newspaper or the newsroom is really uh, key as well. So we, we, walk, we look at the security of those things as, as another area of concern or focus. Um, of course, we're concerned about our cloud architecture and infrastructure. We've moved out of data centers everywhere. We're, we're a very cloud-centric company now. I think any news organization that's still running data centers is possibly making a mistake. Um, so, uh, you know, having secure cloud architecture that is both um, redundant uh, available, but also, you know, absolutely secure and monitorable is really, really key. And finally, you know, what I, I'm going to kind of lump into enterprise security here, but this is just the gray business of the gray lady, right? This is, we're just like every other company out there. So we have legacy systems we need to keep in track of. We have kind of, you know, the not so exciting information security things like your HR systems or your, your accounts payable systems, which are very exciting because they involve real people's lives and getting paid. Um, but that's a huge area for us to also pay a great deal of attention to. And that's really the, the nutshell of, you know, you look at the newsroom very specifically and then the rest of the, uh, the company at large. So let's look at some hard problems that we face that we can't really solve. We, you know, these are not things that we're like one of many uh, who would desire these outcomes, but these are really, you know, kind of interesting hard problems. And if you're looking for a challenge out there, please take a look at my list of hard problems and solve them for me and just, you know, produce the golden goose because that would be 
awesome. Um, one of the things we run into all the time on social media platforms is a lack of, of clarity and consistency in language and presentation security controls. Social media platforms really seem to like to change their security controls all the time, change how they're referring to things, even at the most basic manner, so that when um, we say, hey, this is what you do to do this, and one of our people goes, I don't see that button, and we look at it, and we go, it was there yesterday. Um, if there was a system or a scheme where uh, the policy you would like as an individual for your security controls and privacy controls could be read from a file as opposed to like, you know, clicked on a bunch of random click boxes on five different tabs, that would be great. Um, uh, so if you have any influence or control over this, that would be wonderful. Um, I really like someone to produce the uh, holy grail of telecommunications devices. I need something about this big. Um, it does like multiple hundreds of megs of bandwidth reliably, uh, runs on batteries. Um, so that when we send journalists to uh, natural disasters or conflict areas or just out into the you know, hinterlands of the world, we, they have a way to return us high quality, rich journalism. Um, we're not just a print org anymore. It's not just some words we need to stream out. We're not just dictating phone, you know, dictating uh, stories over teletypes now. We've, we've, we're trying to move up the scale of, of the kind of media we're producing. So that would be great if you could do that, you know, not asking for much. Uh, as we all know, when you get a large gathering of people together, a festival or an event or a rally, um, we often see uh, modern telecommunications, wireless telecommunications kind of grind to a halt um, or slow way down. And then what happens is journalists basically have to go to the event, cover it as best they can, and then get back to some sort of, usually a landline, but sometimes, you know, just outside of that cell area to file their story and provide some, some context for it. So really um, what we're looking for is something like a wireless mesh network, something like Gotenna or Meshtastic that can send print ready photos or video as well as long bits of text. Um, that would be an amazing little tool to help us get that working. Um, we'd love some tools that allow for uh, lightweight mobile opt-in mobile device management. So we work with freelancers and their phones are their phones. They're not our phones. We're not going to top down, just like start putting our policy on their phone. Um, so something that is, but we could come up with some like, you know, quick enrollment thing where we're like, under these circumstances, what do you want us to do? Da, 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 da. So that if they get um, detained for whatever reason, we can, we can A, know that they're detained because we can track them physically and we're allowed to through their device, or, you know, we can uh, lock their phone for them. Um, in that same vein, remote ch journalist check-in tools, these generally don't work at scale, and we have a lot of journalists, so we do a lot of check-ins. So if there's a tool out there that would allow uh, basically a way for journalists to self-enroll for a security check-in and then, um, and then check it, it would check in and they would be able to report back. And if the check-in didn't work or they hit the red button because the, the meeting is not going well and they really do need some backup, um, that would be wonderful. Tor network speeds, I love it when a source comes to us and says, hey, I've got six gigs of data I want to drop on you. And we're like, yes, that's wonderful. And then they say, over an onion share. And I'm like, because uh, I know downloading six gigs of data over the Tor network is really, really, really painful. Um, so anything you can do to help speed up the Tor network speeds would be great. Um, operating proper relays and exit nodes is wonderful. Supporting them financially so they can hire more folks to work on the project. Tor is currently working on increasing their network speeds. I'm really excited about that project at many different levels. Speaking of that six, six gigs of data we just got, um, it would be really great if um, we had a really wonderful set of tools for source media sanitization. Um, we are looking at tools right now, but it doesn't seem like anyone makes a really great robust method for sanitizing masses of data um, at scale in a newsroom. Uh, especially with a lot of the controls and features we would like to see as a news organization and not a financial organization or an insurance organization.
finally, we have all this data, right? Better tools for searching and analyzing large mixed file sets. You just get a lot of random stuff in folders sometimes, and you're like, okay, this is photos of PDFs. Interesting. Um, you can't just grep that. Uh, maybe it's mixed set, right? Maybe it's it could be a lot of different data. So handle, having a way to handle that would be wonderful. Finally, an external message handling tool for secure messaging platforms. When we start getting 10x messages in our tip line because of a, of a campaign from a, a group that would really like to be heard, it makes, us very, it makes it very difficult for us to weed through all of that information. Um, so something that we could operate that would allow us to manage all those messages in a secure way and do some filtering and binning so we can really go, okay, this is all from this, but the, here's a unique tip and here's a not unique tip um, would be great, especially for apps like WhatsApp, Signal, Telegram. Um, again, not, uh, not an easy thing, but definitely worth, worth doing, especially we want these tools to be uh, tools for civil good. Those are the hard problems. Oh, and finally, Bellingcat has their own list of OSINT projects that they're working on that uh, that are just all GitHub stuffs. Definitely check out Bellingcat's work um, and their need for uh, building tools for open source investigators. So maybe you want to get involved. Maybe I, hopefully I've inspired you. Um, please think about attending uh, the Internet Freedom Festival. There possibly will be some similar meetups like that in the States in the next couple months. So definitely stay on the app. Stay on the lookout for those. Attend a journalist convention if you feel like that's another great place to like kind of get a flavor for what's going on. Um, if you're looking for work, check out the Digital Rights Job Board. A lot of posts are put up there. I post all the New York Times jobs to that board um, as they come up, and there are openings right now at the Times in the security group. Uh, we have major. There, I mean, we're not the only. We're not the. You know, there are other newspapers out there. There are other news orgs. Surprise. Um, so definitely check out, you know, the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, uh, the Washington Post, CNN, BBC, Reuters, the AP, Gannett. Um, and also, you know, if you don't want to switch your job, but you just want to try and help, you know, your local newspaper, it's a really good idea. Local news is really, really, really important. And it's really, really, really on the ropes right now. Um, so definitely think about, you know, checking in at your local newspaper, even if it's an alt-weekly, and asking if they, they want any help. Because they might, they probably do need the help. And um, even if it's just advisement, it could lead to something, it could not, but it could definitely help. Um, if you are a researcher, um, if you like working in NGOs, uh, you like doing advocacy, definitely check out some of the NGOs working in the space. There's the Committee to Protect Journalists who helped me get some of my stats. Um, there's Reporters Sans Frontier, they're a wonderful organization. Uh, the International Federation of Journalists is out there working on behalf of journalists internationally. Uh, the International Women's Media Foundation is another great place to look. And then, you know, the Freedom of the Press Foundation, a lot of folks, I bet you, in this very room are from that, from that organization. So uh, please, um, please think about working for one of them or working with them. And there's, there's a bunch more I didn't even name. Um, also working on these same issues. So hopefully you found this talk enlightening. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask me. You can hit me up on Twitter. My DMs are open. Uh, and I'm not a great Twitter person, by the way, but I will look. I will keep an eye out for you. So feel free to ask me any questions you like. Thank you so much, and have a good day.